Graham Fuller is one of the foremost authorities on global Muslim politics. He is a student of Muslim West relations, and he has worked on the ground addressing major issues from the roots of terrorism to present-day turmoil in conflicted Arab countries. He has a Harvard degree, two of them. He worked for 20 years as a CIA operations officer. He was vice chair of the National Intelligence Council at the CIA. And after he finished government service, he worked as a senior political scientist at the RAND Corporation. Fuller is the author of A World Without Islam. It is my pleasure to welcome Graham Fuller to Studio 4 to tell us more. And welcome to British Columbia, because I know you're now living here. That's right, Fanny, in Squamish. Mm -hmm. uh, did you pick Squamish, or did Squamish pick you? No, we picked Squamish. I mean, anybody who goes there, I think, can't fail to be overwhelmed by the beauty mm. and the surroundings. How do you get into the CIA? Well, it was a funny thing. I studied lots of languages, Russian and Arabic and things when I was at university because I was just interested. Mm -hmm. And then suddenly there was a draft, such a thing as a draft in those days. I got drafted into the military, got put into military intelligence, and the next thing I knew I was ended up in, in CIA. So it wasn't what I had been planning. When you were a young man, uh, did you entertain the thought of being a spy of not sorts? Not remotely. No, not remotely. I was going to be an academic, but I was thrilled when I was 16 years old reading these National Geographic magazines mm. with camels and crazy Arabic writing, and I knew that that's what I wanted mm. to, to study. Uh, who trains you uh, in the CIA? Do you train with people from around the globe or only with Americans, or how does that work? Well, basically, the training is conducted by other Americans, but first of all, they're looking for, for Americans who uh, have experience, some experience overseas or mm -hmm. are interested in, and, 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 you know, inclined in that direction. But certainly living overseas, you very fast uh, get a sense of uh, what overseas realities are, if, if you're that mm -hmm. type of temperament. And your first overseas assignment was? Uh, Turkey. Mm. And what was going on in Turkey in those days? Uh, it was uh, it was relatively quiet. There was a there was a, there were some very active left wing movements that the United States was worried about at that point. Might communist perhaps? Who knows? Mm -hmm. um, but uh, it wasn't big time stuff like we see today in, mm -hmm. in the Middle East, rioting and revolution and that type of stuff. In a post 9/11 world, where where were you uh, on 9/11? Standing on a treadmill in a gym uh, in, in Maryland outside D.C., uh, watching all this happening. And your thoughts, your first thoughts, somebody who's been in the trenches, who knows what's going on yeah. in the world more than most. I lived in the area for a very long time, you know, Fanny, and I was horrified and shocked, but not remotely surprised, because I think anybody who had been living in the area for very long knew that the tensions and anger had been building up for years, decades mm -hmm. even, perhaps. So the question really wasn't why did it happen then, but maybe why it didn't happen sooner. And as you know, uh, uh, today, uh, most Arab leaders, uh, be they in power for 30 years, 40 years, uh, say the arrogant powers must get out of the Arab world. And uh, by arrogant powers, I'm suspecting they mean the United States of America. Well, <laughs> if the shoe fits. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I think there is a great deal of resentment about what has been a long-term Western uh, interventionism in the Middle East, actually going back to the British and the French a long time ago, and then picked up by the United States. I think at this point it's imperative for the West to get out of the business of telling the Middle East how to run their societies, out of the business of supporting dictators that the people don't want, and out of the business I just saw in today's press talk talking about, oh my God, there's a vacuum is opened up now as if mm -hmm. the United States has to rush in and fill that vacuum. We shouldn't be doing that anymore. Why not? Because I think we are leading to, first of all, it makes, it, it, it leads to the infantilization, if you will, of the public uh, that feels that they have no control over anything. We're just, we're just sort of children. The West comes in, the U.S. comes in, tells us what to do. Our dictators tell us what to do. It leads to a kind of cynicism, uh, a bitterness. Uh, a sense of fatalism, that there's nothing we can do to change our lives, which is then an easy segue on into uh, terrorism, uh, radical reactions to things that go on. Now, these people need a chance to grow up politically and exercise their own mm -hmm. political um, uh, rights. As you know, Bob Ray wrote a book recently called Exporting Democracy, and right. he agrees with you on, men, uh, on, on much of your thinking in a world without Islam, in that uh, you can define democracy, but when you export it, <laughs> you have to think about that, and who are you to export it? 
or to support a dictator, but say, but we want you to be democratic. But now the people are saying, as you know, enough is enough. Are they really? In, in, in Libya, in Egypt, in Tunisia, is that what they're saying to you? Um, sure. Uh, I think definitely there's a powerful desire to be independent of external intervention, and that includes the right to choose their own mm -hmm. leaders who are not supported by outsiders. It's got to come. The longer this goes on with, with, with Western uh, obsessive kind of uh, uh, messing around in these situations, the more uh, the radicalism grows. So it's, it's, it's time for a change. Why did you write A World Without Islam? Good question. Uh, I was in, in, in the course of writing some other books, I became impressed across the Middle East when I would talk with Islamists and Islamic leaders in one place or another that most of the things they were talking about really didn't have much to do with religion. It had everything to do with politics and why there are no democratic, why there are no elections, why the human rights are ignored, uh, what's, why the Palestinians are being completely ignored, this type of thing. So I finally realized, you know, Islam really it is not the basic factor of explanation here. In other words, put it this, you can, you, you can explain almost everything that's going on in terms of the violence between mm -hmm. East and West today without the, the, the Islamic factor. Or perhaps the Christian factor or the Jewish factor. If you look at the three major religions, right. uh, uh, there would still be crusades uh, without Islam, as you point out clearly in here, but the whole idea that religion breeds violence. I, I mean, I know there's unrest because of religious beliefs. I understand that. But is there, in your research, anything unique specifically about Islam that breeds violence? Let me step back from that in a sense, Fanny, only that I think if you have centuries often of Western intervention, imperialism, colonial control, seizing foreign uh, energy resources, propping up dictators, control, manipulating elections by the outside. Mm -hmm. Uh, you don't need Islam to be angry about all these things. So I think what Islam can do and other religions can do as well is serve as a kind of banner, if you will, a rallying point whereby people say, hey, it's not just us Egyptians, it's the whole Muslim world that we're getting you know, uh, worked over by the West. And, 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 and so you can, you can build a, a greater uh, momentum, I would say, mm -hmm. through the use of religion. But religion isn't the cause. It becomes the banner and the slogan for for activism. So let's go to terrorism. The root causes of terrorism. What are they? Um, well, we've been through a great many of them, but if you have no control over your own destiny in the country and you feel that outsiders are taking advantage of your country, um, and indeed today when you have uh, U.S. armies uh, on the ground, U.S. Mm -hmm. you know, Marine boots kicking down doors, uh, a lot of people are getting killed, including innocent civilians, it's not remotely surprising that people do turn to terrorism as their weapon of choice when they don't have armies, they don't have tanks, they don't have jet, jet aircraft. Sure, and it's a scourge on society. You point that out clearly in A World Without Islam, but you also say, uh, we'll never stop it on Earth, but we can limit it and control it. Yeah, I think if the source, main sources of grievance are, are dealt with, you can begin to let this area calm down. But right now it's at a state of, of high boil, mm -hmm. if you will, all the way across the region with constant wars and, and, and foreign military forces, foreign occupation. So my first, the, one of my conclusions in the book is a first simple step is you've got to get Western troops out of the area and begin to allow the area to calm down, uh, begin to choose their own leaders. And it may not be the people we, we want right away to be running the country, but at some point they've got to run their own countries. 